right, everybody. Looks like the crowd is starting together. We're glad to see you here. Glad to have you participating in the broadcast tonight. Uh, as we have announced, we're going to be talking about worldview. So perhaps uh, you've already got a question formulated in your mind about worldview, and you can just put it in the queue there. Uh, it helps if you get your questions coming in uh, as soon as possible. I understand that you may want to listen a little while before you know just exactly what to ask, and that's that's not unreasonable. But uh, don't get to the point where you forget to get your question in, and then at the end of the program we start running out of time to answer all the questions. But um, we're glad to see everyone uh, coming in. Now, another thing we'd ask you to do is to share this feed on your page. And so just where the video is showing up here uh, on, on my page or the Bible Talk page, it'll just click share and that'll uh, put it on your page and others can see it who may be just visiting or whatever. And uh, that's how we build the audience. We've been getting between four and 500 views on most of our broadcasts and so this is very good uh, we're encouraged by that but we'd like to get it up to a thousand or more than a thousand uh, if it's possible so uh, start um, sharing the page or the, the video feed start formulating your questions and here in just a moment we're going to start uh, with a few things that I want to say about world view All right, folks. Well, we're very glad again that you're here with us tonight, and we hope that you will enjoy participating. Uh, as we've already asked, share the feed on your page with others, and then uh, we'll get start building our audience and try to expand the program. Share it on a page that you're a, a group you're a member of. If you're a member of one of the groups of, of brethren, share it there. Or if you're in a, a group that would allow this type of video to be shared, well, then share it there. Just give everyone the opportunity. Uh, that's, the, that's the beauty of this. They, you can share it and they can tune in. If they don't like it, they can change the channel. And uh, we're not offended by that. But if they hear something interesting, if you tune in and you, this is the first time you're listening, you hear something interesting, you hear something you'd like to ask a question about, that's what we do here. And if you hear something you disagree with, well, that's all right, too. Just tell us that you disagree. We'd like to have a biblical basis for that disagreement. Uh, and so if you could cite a passage or passages that you think might refute something I say tonight or any time would be most welcome so we can study with you and perhaps you can lead us to something that we have not known or understood before. As I announced, I want to talk about worldview. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to define worldview, at least for some, in the audience because even though it's a pretty popular term here the last couple of years it's not a term that um, we've generally used in everyday conversation we all have a worldview we just may not know how to express that but when I talk about what is or ask the question what is your worldview uh, your worldview is how you look at the world oh, that's really complex isn't it view how look uh, world that's what we're looking at so your worldview is your perspective on the world. Now, we're not just talking about your opinions about things. We're talking about your general philosophy, your core beliefs about things, and then this is the lens through which you look at everything else in the world. And so when you look at creation, you have a perspective from which you are looking, a philosophical perspective, a belief uh, perspective. What is your faith or what is your conviction about the world? A lot of people scoff at faith, but I submit to you that everyone has faith about something. And that faith ultimately is at the heart of their worldview. But as I said, your worldview is how you look at the world. It's the lens through which you view things. It's how you believe everything operates your explanation for why things happen uh, the way they do. Most importantly, your worldview defines your purpose in life. Your worldview answers 
the big little questions by which I mean where do I come from why am I here and what is my destiny what am I supposed to be doing to achieve my ultimate purpose the answers you give to these questions will determine how you think about everything else in life what you believe about where you came from and what you are doing here and what you are ultimately to achieve determines what you go about doing in life a lot of people have never even taken the time to answer the question well, where did I come from well my mother gave birth to me okay but now where did your mother come from where'd your father come from where'd your grandparents come from where did all of humanity come from you see that's the question you've got to answer because where you came from determines what you think about yourself uh, if you think that you are uh, descended from apes, then you very well will act like a monkey. If you think you crawled out from under a rock, then you will probably act like things that crawl out from underneath a rock. And so if you, if you don't believe you have an origin that was life-giving and intellect-possessing, then you believe you just are the result of a random combination as a matter of pure chance a random co uh, combination of molecules and chemicals and a big puddle of water and then poof there was an amoeba which split and became a paramecium that split and became a chicken that split and became a dinosaur that split and became a man that's the idea did you is that how you came into the world that's your worldview. That's what I'm talking about. Where'd you come from? What are you supposed to be doing? If your idea of, of, of the reason why you are here is just to have a good, t good time, you're like the old hedonist, let's eat and drink and be merry and die. Well, then, you know, if you crawled out from underneath the rock and you're only here for so long and then after that you're gone, then uh, you need to think about what your purpose is. is it, are you living like that? Or do you think that you are the result of an eternal life-giving spirit who, pos who possesses all the wisdom of all the ages and then some, whose very being transit transcends uh, the physical universe, then you, you come from something more important than a puddle of mud you just didn't crawl out of a pool of slime and drop your tail and then evolve into a naked ape. There's more to it than that. And if that's what you believe, that there's more to it, then you're faced with some choices in life. Why am I here? Is my ultimate destiny just to die? Is that it? No higher purpose, no... Nothing for me to accomplish that has eternal consequences or can even endure through eternity. You see, realistically, there are only two possible worldviews. You're either a theist or you're an atheist. You have a theistic worldview or you have an atheistic worldview. You must hold to one or the other. You can't hold to both. And the two of them are mutually exclusive. Either there is a God or there isn't. That's the question. We either exist by chance in a random com com combination of molecules and water, which has evolved over eons of time through millennia of evolution process, and the best possible world that could ever exist is the only the one in which the fittest survive. That's, that's atheism, folks. And the only law is the law of the jungle. There are no absolutes. There is no truth. There's no political truth. There's no moral truth. There's no spiritual truth. There is no truth. It's whatever you think. And what you think is right if you have the might to make it so. That's an atheistic position. I know that some atheists will disagree. They say, oh, no, I, I don't believe in that. Well, why don't you believe in that? 
That's what you're telling us. You see, this is why it's important, and this is why particularly young people must have a settled world view before they go off into the world. Go off into college, and, and their professors challenge them, many of them atheistic professors, and challenge their beliefs and try to undermine their understanding of God. They've never been confronted with the kind of arguments that are made out there in the world and so faith is shaken and then perhaps maybe they are too and give up. Or they just think mom and dad weren't very smart and this fellow's got a lot of alphabet soup after his name. He's been to college. He's a teacher. He ought to know things and he says there is no God. He explains the universe in this way and says all that the enlightened and intelligent people of the world believe what he believes and that's just not true. They don't. I don't accept his definition of educated and enlightened, but even some who are educated and enlightened as he is don't believe that. You're not an ignoramus because you believe in God. You're not a rude because you didn't think you crawled out of a pool of mud. So you have to have a worldview. So the theistic worldview, the view that I hope you hold tonight, explains origins, it explains purpose and destiny by considering the reality of God. The question then for developing this worldview and understanding, beginning to understand how the world operates, is by posing the simple question, if God then If God, then what? Well, God is transcended, as I said a moment ago. He transcends his creation. He exists outside of creation, outside of time, outside of space, outside of matter. That's hard for some people to perceive. It's hard for me to perceive. But nevertheless, that's what the Bible teaches. If God is contained within space and time, he's not God. Maybe you've never thought about that. That answers so many questions with regard to miracles and other things in ages past. God transcends his creation. He is not bound by his creation. He can suspend or work within the laws of nature and accomplish his purpose. Everything that exists exists by virtue of the fact that he has created it. That explains a lot of things. If you accept the reality that you're made in the image of God, that answers all the questions about morality and your your eternal nature. You're not just mud and dirt and water. You're not just flesh and passion. You're not without an explanation for the universe and your sense of ought, the reason why you believe certain things are right and wrong. You can explain why you think and reason and believe and act the way you do because you understand you're made in the image of God. We derive not only our origin from God, but our purpose. Our purpose is derived from God. Ephesians 3.10 talks about God's eternal purpose. No one builds anything without intending it to have a purpose. Remember as a kid, I used to see these cartoons called the Rube Goldberg. And a Rube Goldberg was a machine. It was just an imaginary machine that was drawn and it didn't do anything. It didn't accomplish anything. It didn't have any purpose other than to, to, I guess it had the purpose to entertain, so even it was not purposeless, but it was not a work-producing or product-producing machine. And so the term Rube Goldberg, this is a Rube Goldberg, or he's a Rube Goldberg, refers to people who are aimless, purpose, purposeless, who aren't getting anything accomplished. God did not create a Rube Goldberg. He created the heaven and earth and man and he put them 
over all the dominion, over dominion of all the things that God had made. And this purpose, which God has for us, is revealed in the scriptures. If God, there's got to be a revelation. If God, I've got to be able to find out what God wants me to do. And the thing about it is, is the Bible is the only book that claims to be a revelation of the mind of the one true God. You can talk about these other books, the 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 the, the Quran or the Sanskrit or any of these uh, holy documents that are associated with the religions of the East, and not a one of them claims to be a revelation of spiritual and physical truth relative to the salvation of mankind explains all of that. They don't claim to have anything to do with that. They claim to be wisdom or they claim to be applicable and that religions have formed around them. But the Bible is the only book that claims to be from God and claims to be telling us what we need to do to be saved. And it's, you know, depending on which edition you have, it's not but a few a couple of hundred pages, maybe a thousand pages. And and you ought to be able to read it and come to knowledge. And then finally, let me suggest to you that the entire universe can and must be explained considering the existence and the transcendence and the eternal purpose of God. There is no explanation for the universe without that. Well, I've got some things here that I want to consider with you in, in the next few minutes, but if this would be a good place for you to perhaps ask some questions. I see several of you out there tonight, and evidently there may be some of you that are, yeah, look here, there's a lot of folks that have signed in below where my feed was. So all of y'all are welcome, and, and now's a good time to ask questions. And I know there are some of you who don't sign in, and, and that's okay. Uh, but if you want to ask a question, uh, you're going, you, you can do it here. And there's never a bad question. When I used to do this on live radio, I said there's never a bad or a wrong question. The only question that can fall into that category is the one that was never asked. That, that's how we learn. We all have to ask questions, and we all have questions about the Bible. I've been studying the Bible a long time, but I still have a lot of questions about things that the Bible says. So please feel free to ask your question tonight. And if you want to chime in on this subject of worldview, you're more than welcome to do so. Or if you just want to ask a question, then uh, put that in the feed, and I'll be happy to get to it. Uh, and also, some of you who may have picked this up on another page, I don't always get the feed that uh, from from those pages in the program. And so if you really want to get a question asked tonight, you probably should go on over to, the, uh, to my page, to Jeff Asher here on Facebook, J-E-F-F-A-S-H-E-R, Jeff Asher, and you can get in the feed there. Now, we do have a question here. This is this is a good question. How does all the violence we see, see around us affect our worldview? Are we positive or are we negative in our worldview? Well, I think we are positive in that in opposing this violence, whether it's uh, racial violence or it's just meanness, as we used to say when I was growing up, that's just motivated by no other thing than the fact that I can steal or I want to steal or whatever it might be. Um, whatever the motivation for it, uh, if it ends in the, the wrongful death of a human being, and I don't care what color they are, but if it ends in the wrongful death of a human being, then the Christian is on the right side of that question. And he's the only one who has any defense uh, for, for seeking out punishment and justice against those who have wrought that violence. Because it is the believer who says, this man, regardless of his race, regardless of his uh, financial position, regardless of his country of origin, regardless of whatever circumstances in life he may be found, if his life has been taken from him unjustly, then it is the duty of the believer to stand up and to say, that man 
was made in the image of God. That's That takes us back to Genesis chapter 9, I believe. I'm turning there. But that man was made in the image of God, and because he bore the image of God, to take his life in violence, whether it's because of, of racial hatred or it's because of jealousy or envy or covetousness, whatever the motivation might be, anger, to do that is to, to mar, to desecrate the image of God. Now, if there is no God, what possible defense or, or apology can we make for the life of the individual who has been slain? It's the, it's the law of the jungle. We may have law on our land, but our law is inconsistent with the belief that we're just here as a result of evolution. The men who founded our government did not believe that. Those who have followed in their footsteps did not believe that. As imperfect as they were, they understood that men were in the image of God and God was their creator and human life was sacred. Moses said in Genesis chapter 9, Surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed for in the image of God made he man. God's justification for justice in response to violence is one is made in the image of man, or one is made in the image of God. Man is made in the image of God. And to slay him is to mar that image. Now let's just, well, it's not just murder Jeff. That's right. The golden rule. Look at that passage. Now you see here again, if you're not a Christian, I, I had a fellow one time on the radio making fun of, of Christians. He said, well, I don't believe that I should do unto others as they, as they would have me do, uh, as I would have them do unto me, just simply because I'm afraid of some invisible deity, deity parent. And so he was making fun of God. He was blaspheming God when he said that. But he, what he was basically saying is, is that he was so intelligent that he could intuit that we ought to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Now, you think about that. Is that how the world has been operating for the last six millennia? I know that's what God has said, and I know that's what Christians do and should do. Look there in, in Matthew chapter 7. Uh, and verse 12, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. It's a revelation from God. That's his point. <laughs> you do this because God told you to do this. You do this because this is what upholds the image of God in man. You treat others the same way you want to be treated. Now the reason for that is stated here. But now, if you don't believe in God, if you believe you crawled out of a puddle of mud and that you're not any better or any worse than the lions and the tigers and the bears and that really, in some instances, we've got some folks in the, in the world today who believe that an animal is better than a man. Now, that's a fouled up worldview. That which was put here for our use for either food or for domestication to be used in labor, the, 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 plus the use of all the resources of the, of the earth which God blessed us with and gave us dominion over. He said, this is yours. Use it. Fill the whole earth. That's what God said. Why do you think the earth is so full of these wonderful riches? Because God wanted man to disperse over the earth and fill it. And so here... If you believe God, then you're going to treat one another the right way. That's how that's going to be possible. That's how governments are going to be able to exist. That's how economies are going to be able to succeed because they're built on the precepts of honesty and integrity and kindness. And if you believe that you crawled out of a puddle of mud, then how in the world are you going to come up with the idea that I need to do unto him as I would have him do unto me because 
I believe in the law of the jungle. Whether you say you do or don't, your position demands that you believe in the law of the jungle. If it's survival of the fittest, then only the fit survive. And whatever it takes to survive is what's required. So I believe we're positive, but at the same time, I, I would be willing to admit we're negative. Because we're certainly opposed to murder. We're certainly opposed to abortion. We're certainly opposed to theft. We're certainly opposed to these evils. And when me, we see men who are doing these things and pursuing an unjust course, as so many are, then we have to be negative about it. We have to oppose that. So, yes, rioting is wrong. Yes, stealing is wrong. Yes, abusive speech is wrong. Yes, disobeying the law of the land is wrong. Now, another brother asked this question, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. How does that fit into the world view of the Christian? That is a very good question. You guys are leading me through my discussion tonight. Thank you so much. Keep it coming. So here in 1 John 2, John says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And so there's that duality that we were talking about earlier. Either you're a theist or you're an atheist. Now the atheist loves the world. John will say in this same uh, epistle over here in chapter 4 that he uh, ver what is it verse 4 and 5 let me read that ye are of God there's one world view ye are of God little children and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world they are of the world and so they're in league with the devil that's the net result they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world. They don't talk like we do. They don't believe what we do. They're speaking from a different place. They're speaking from a different perspective. And when we're speaking, we're speaking from the divine perspective. And they think we're crazy. That's what Peter says. Think it not strange that they wonder why it is you don't run with them out in the world. They don't understand Christianity. Why? Because they're following that survival of the fittest, that give in to your passion, do whatever you want to do, do what makes you feel good. And that's the way the animals behave. Do whatever pleases you and, and do it till you're full or you're fill and do it while you can because tomorrow you're going to die. Now here, John says in 1 John chapter 2 that we are not to love the world. And so there's the difference, you see. We look at the world and we don't, he's not talking about the planet. He's not talking about the people in the world. We love the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's John 3.16. I think everybody knows that passage. So he's not talking about the people nor is he talking about the planet from the standpoint of conservation and preservation. What he's talking about is this spiritual decay and corruption that is in the world, and it is in the world through lust. The appeal to the carnal in man, nobody denies that man is human, but he's not human only in the standpoint of flesh. He's not just flesh. There's a spirit. There's a heart that dwells within each one of us, the spiritual man. Jesus talks about that, the inner and the outer man. And so, and he speaks concerning those who will uh, live eternally. This was in our reading Sunday morning. Let's see if I can remember what it was. I think it was Luke chapter 13. But I'm not putting my finger on it right now. It'll come to me directly, maybe. But back to 1 John 2. So we don't love the world. That is the, the appeal that Satan makes through our lust 
the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, what we see, what we desire, uh, what we have ambition for. And so Satan appeals to us in that way. And so we don't look at the world like other people do. They look at uh, sensuality and fornication and adultery and they say, oh, it's just sex. No, it's not just sex. Again, you mar the image of God within you when you behave like that. And so we see the world differently. And so we abstain from those things that Scripture tells us are contrary to the will of God and, and, and evil and hurtful and harmful to the, the man and the inner man in particular. And so we strive, we look at the world differently. And if the Christian is looking at the world through the eyes of, of lust, through the yearnings of the flesh, and through the evil ambitions of the heart, in other words, all we're interested in is getting rich and having pleasure and, and, and uh, being viewed as somebody, then we're looking at the world altogether wrong. And so... That's, that is how our world view. We resist that. The world is just the opposite, as we saw in chapter 4. Okay, here's, uh, here's one. Uh, explain the difference between globalism versus the kingdom of God view. Well, that's an interesting question. The kingdom of God, the reign of God, the rule of God, is a rule that is benevolent. Let's just put it that way. God loved the world. He loved the world so much that he sent his son to die for man. And all who believe and trust in the death of Jesus and come to Christ through repentance and obedience to the gospel, in particular water baptism, confession of faith and water baptism, that person is added to the kingdom. He's born again. He now is translated out of the kingdom of the devil, First Col uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, and translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And so we enter into a benevolent rule. The sovereign over us is Jesus Christ, who rules over us according to the will of God, which is in our behalf and for our good. Now, globalism, and I don't want to wander off too far into politics, but globalism, as I understand it, is one world government. And any explanation of globalism that I have ever seen involves socialism, which ultimately deteriorates into communism, which has always been atheistic. And so we're talking about the devil taking over the world. You know, when Jesus was tempted of Satan, and the devil brought him up to exceedingly high mountain there in Matthew chapter 4. He says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth if you'll just bow down and worship me. I do not believe that that was an empty promise. He most certainly could have delivered the kingdoms of the earth to the extent that he controlled them, not to the extent that the prophets had said Jesus would have the kingdoms of the earth. Unto him would the gathering of the peoples be, Isaiah said. But that's talking about coming to him in faith, coming to him as the Redeemer. The, the, the devil was asking Jesus to bow down and worship him and forego the cross. He says, you want the kingdoms of the world? You don't have to go to Calvary to get those. I'll give them to you if you'll just bow down and worship me. Now, I don't see anything. The, the, the devil, you look at the book of Revelation, it was the devil who was running the kingdoms of the world back in the first century, and the devil's been running those kingdoms ever since. And the only only idea here of globalism would be that it would extend to the whole world, and, and, and it, I can't see how it would be good for anybody. One is based on the benevolent needs of mankind as God, his maker, perceives them. The other is based upon the greed and the desire for power of a select few who will rule harshly ultimately over all who submit to it. Now, if you want to fuss with me about that, I'll be happy to do it, but not tonight on the program. Um, Matthew 6, 19 through 21. 
should help us with worldview, and it will help us with worldview. So let's turn over there and read that passage. I tell you what, you guys are doing a better job than I was as far as outlining tonight. This is great. All right. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth doth rust and corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heavens where neither moth nor, doth, nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Now here's the problem. This, this is so good, Aaron. Here's the problem. This shows the faith nature of our relationship or our, our worldview. Because two things are contrary. Lay up for yourself treasures here on the earth. And here it talks about your gold and your silver cankering or rusting or corrupting. Someone says, well, gold doesn't corrupt. Let me tell you something. That paper burns. And that stuff's not backed by anything, best I can tell. And if it's gone, it's gone. If the economy collapses, we're all in a world of hurt. And I'm not suggesting that it will, and I certainly don't want it to. But I'm just trying to get you to understand that these things don't last. And even if you had all of them, and this is where you go, he says, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven and I was talking about the faith nature of our uh, world view but we turn over here to the 16th chapter before I finish that point and, and, and drive home this idea of the transient nature of wealth Jesus says for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul. You see, the man who believes in God is able to discern the reality of heaven and by that gauge the wealth or the worth of his soul. I sometimes pre preach a sermon, the title of which is, What Are You Worth? And the price has been going up over the last couple of decades, but we're still not worth $10. And the most valuable piece of or organ that you have on your body is your skin. You could be tanned and, and get a good pair of boots and a couple of wallets and uh, out of your hide. But you're mostly water, dirty water at that. A few trace elements that don't add up to, to, to a quarter's worth. Some gold, some silver, some nickel, maybe a little platinum and few other things unless the doctor left one of his instruments inside of you at some time and uh, so you have a little extra but you're not worth 10 bucks tops but here Jesus says you're worth a lot more than just your body or what you're able to uh, acquire in life Jesus said you're worth many more than many sparrows, you're worth more than the ravens, you're, you're worth more than the lilies of the field, you're worth more than the sheep, all these things, that, and you're worth more than all of the wealth of the whole world, because you have a soul. See, we're back to made in the image of God. That which is in the image of God has sinned, that's First John 2, and Christ has died for that which is in the image of God, and his death is sufficient before the God of heaven to redeem you and everyone else, the whole world, from sin. And so you're called upon to believe and to repent and confess the name of Christ and be baptized into him for the remission of sins. Just read Mark 16, 15 and 16 and Acts 2, 38 and 1 Peter 3. And verse 21. And so, you're worth more than many sparrows. And so, you're, the worldview you ought to have needs to be determined by a proper understanding of who God is and who you are in relation to God and how He has valued your soul. And you need to come to realize that if you lose your soul and gain the whole world, you have gained nothing and lost 
everything. I don't know what else to say. Now here's an interesting question. Again, this is, is getting back to this idea of who's running things. But, but Brian asked, do men have to control population growth so that the world is not overpopulated? Oh, let's, let's, let's look at where man tried to control population growth in China. I read an article. If you need me to find it, I will. But I think you can Google search it and come up with it. China and population and male babies. But China's had a policy for a long time that only one child per family because there's over a billion people in that country and they do not have the natural resources nor the economy at present to support that kind of population. It is what you see on the television is not the reality of China. There are literally millions of people that live in abject poverty on these small little rural farms. They barely have enough to eat in many instances. And so they said we've got to control the population so everybody can just have one child. If you have more than one child then you're going to be penalized. You're not going to get your government stipend. And so a lot of families in China because China is atheistic for the most part or some Eastern religion that doesn't value life as General Westmoreland said one time life in the Orient is cheap. And so there were families who if they had a girl baby they killed the girl baby. Now not all the Chinese did this but there were some who did it so they could have a boy baby. And so there was an unnatural number of males in China. And this article goes on to say that because the Chinese had implemented this policy of one child and that they didn't prohibit abortion and so the natural reality of, of there being a few more women percentage than men did not result and so now we've got a bunch of single men in China who can't find a wife. And now they're concerned about their population surviving and they're concerned about having enough work. They're just, it's just amazing trying to mess things up is what they've done trying to control things. It is not in the power of man to destroy this planet. And I know a lot of people don't want to hear that. But Genesis chapter 8, 20 and 21 says, As long as earth remaineth, seed time and harvest shall not cease. I believe that. And so until Christ comes back and the earth is burned up, there's going to be seed time and harvest. That doesn't mean there won't be famines. That doesn't mean there won't be diseases, pandemics. That doesn't mean there might be hard times, depressions, and so on. It simply means that the earth will continue to do what God designed it to do. And man is going to suffer the consequences of his actions. But annihilation of the planet or annihilation of the entire human race is not in the purview of mankind. God has reserved that unto himself. Now let's see what else we have. Keep those questions coming because these are really good tonight. Okay, here's 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. And when you just give me a passage like that, that means I may go off everywhere preaching the word. So let's see. John, first, first John 5 and verse 19. And we know that we are of God and the whole world life in wickedness. All right, that's exactly right. But if you do not have a theistic worldview, you look at the world and there's nothing evil. I remember back in the, in, in the 80s when Ronald Reagan called the communist regime of the, of the Soviet Union an evil empire you would have thought that he had slapped his mother. Oh, how dare you say that a government is evil. Now you, that's what it is. It's evil. Communism is evil. More people have died under the, the tyranny of communism than any other form of government. There were more people who died at the hands of Pol Pot in Cambodia than died in all of Europe at the hands of, of Adolf Hitler. And that man was slaughtering his own people, doctors, lawyers, merchants, clerks, people who had skills, who could uh, 
de developed the country and he got rid of merchandising. He sent everybody to the fields to plant rice and millions, literally millions of people died in that little country. That's evil. Communism is evil. And so, but if you're a, if you're a secularist, there's not anything that's evil. Adolf Hitler is not evil. Pol Pot is not evil. Joseph Stalin is not evil. Let me tell you something. Anybody with any sense at all knows that there is evil in the world. But if you acknowledge there is evil, you must acknowledge there is something good, and the reason it is good is because it comes from the divine source. Only a transcendent God who is all love can possibly determine what is good. What did Jesus say to the rich young ruler there in Matthew 19? Why callest thou me good? And he, wasn't, he was challenging what he believed about Jesus, but he goes on to say, You know there is none good but God. The absolute good is in God. And it is because we believe in God and he has told us what is good. The golden rule is good. The Ten Commandments are good. The gospel of Jesus Christ is very good. Since we know what is good, then we are able to determine what is evil. And so the whole world lies under the wicked one. The devil is in charge of all of these things. His lies have been told since the Garden of Eden, and men have believed them and perpetrated them, and, if you'll allow me to say so, improved on them. They've made them worse. Evil men wax worse and worse, Paul wrote to Timothy. And so the, the, the downward spiral of evil and its continuing decaying influence on humanity and the world in which we live, the society, is obviously apparent. That's what's going to determine when the world ends, not the temperature, not the uh, El Nino, not the, the polar bears on the icebergs. What's going to determine the end of this world is when Jesus comes, will he find faith upon the earth? Luke 17. That's the question. Will men just stop believing in God? Okay, another question. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. i got to watch the clock here, too. All right. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish. Now, here is the, 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 the worldview that you and I have, because we believe we're made in the image of God. And God told Adam there with regard to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil said in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die well what died did Adam's body die or did his did he enter into spiritual death and separation from God because of sin Adam went and hid himself he said Adam why are you hiding because I heard you coming and I was afraid well why are you afraid have you eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil the thing I told you not to do have you done that did you sin you violate a positive command of God? That's what they'd done. That's the day they died. They didn't die in their bodies, though their bodies began to die. But they died in their spirit, their relationship to God, and God announced He gave us the first glimmer of grace when He told us that the Christ was going to come. He said, of the woman, there would be one who would be born who would crush the head of Satan underneath his heel. Satan would bruise him. He put Jesus on the cross. Thought he had defeated God and, and, and his plan. And all he did was carry it out. He bruised Jesus momentarily, briefly, three days, three nights in the tomb. But his body saw not corruption and God raised him. And 40 days later he, he set him down at his own right hand. Made him king of kings and lord of lords. And the gospel was preached on the first Pentecost following that great ascension into heaven. And Peter said, This same Jesus whom you have crucified hath God made both Lord and Christ. Now let me get back over here to this passage that Dennis asked me about. 
For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, the body, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. How is it renewed? Through the renewing of the mind, Titus 3, 5, that renewing of the Holy Ghost, that renewal that comes through the, the teaching, the imbibing, the meditating upon, the living of the Word of God. For our, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There's worldview. What, what's, what's your view if you're a Christian, if you're a theist, if you believe in God? You believe that you have a spirit that's going to live forever. That's what you believe. And you, you believe that there's something that God's going to raise up and whatever you endure in this life because you've done what God said to because you've believed and you've trusted in Him and you've lived your life according to His teachings and though you didn't get rich and you didn't have power and that you were pro probably abused by men who did not believe in God or cared nothing for spiritual things and you were cast aside, it doesn't matter because God loves you. You're more than a conqueror. Romans chapter 8. Now, this last verse, while we look not at the things which are seen, that's the planet, the stars, the moon, the sun, our fellow man, and all the works of his hands, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. They're just time. Time's going to run out. But the things which are not seen are eternal. And the only way you believe in anything that's eternal is that you believe in God. You see, if you crawled out of that puddle of mud, the, the clock started ticking. And you know what's going to happen? You're going right back to the earth. That's one thing that the theist and the atheist agree about. When we're dead, this, this body... This tabernacle of clay is going back to the dust. Now, what he doesn't understand and what the believer in Jesus Christ knows is that the God of heaven who made this tabernacle in the first place has more than enough power to bring it up from the dust and to crown it with immortality and join it with our spirits forever and take us home to heaven. And that's what that passage says. I got time here to look at what Sherry has asked. First Peter chapter four, verses seven through eleven. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same as to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the, the ability that God giveth, that God in all things might be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now that's spot on. That's what you and I are supposed to be doing. If we believe that Jesus is coming back, and there's some debate about whether or not Peter is referring to the second coming, I believe that he is. It's at hand. It's drawing nigh. It's, he doesn't mean it's right here this minute. But if if all if the end of all things is at hand, be ye therefore sober and watch. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 25, talking about the end of time. He says, be sober, be awake. Don't be drunk with the passions of the world, but be sober and watch. You be ready for Jesus to come. How do I? How is it that I'm going to be ready, Jeff? Well, you're going to use hospitality without grudging to one another. You're going to uh, have fervent charity among yourselves, and you're going to seek to cover sin. You're not going to let that be the thing that separates and festers and goes on. You're going to you're going to have love toward one another, and you're going to help one another repent and be saved. And you're going to speak the truth of God. And you're going to give with an open hand. And you're going to do all things to glorify God. That's the right worldview. That's a perfect place for us to end up tonight. It's been great. I think I got everybody's questions and talked about all of their passages. And say I can do this again because I've got a bunch of stuff here in front of me. I had not talked about yet. But that's okay. What's your worldview? Are you a theist? Or are you an atheist? Which are you?
And when I say theist, I mean a Christian. I mean a believer in the Word of God and you're doing what God says in His Word. And so we're going to end with this again. What did Jesus say to those who wanted to be saved? He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. You're going to be saved with Jesus and the saints, or you're going to be condemned with the devil and his angels in the lake that burns with fire forever and forever. I don't wave your hand and just dismiss that. You need to take that to heart and think about it seriously and determine whether or not you are prepared to meet God. Well, we'll be back here next Thursday and then on the week of the 20th, uh, I'm going to be with Bruce Reeves in uh, Amarillo, Texas. And I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do. I may set up something that will run automatically or post it so you can watch it, but it just be a rerun of something else. Or I may do a live report from out there at the debate and have it ready for you one evening. Uh, but I'll not be here on the 20th, the week of the 20th, because we're going to be tied up every night in that debate. We're talking about what is being styled as realized eschatology. If you want more information about that debate, look at my Facebook page. Look at the Bible Talk group. Look at the Bible Talk page. All that information is there. You may have to scroll down a little bit. Thank you so very much, and we'll see you next time.